it's been a pretty good overview. We talked about, you know, atoms, elements, isotopes, fission, chain reaction. Now we can jump into, I guess what I'll say, the macro world of parts of a reactor. All this other stuff was nuclear physics, micro, things you can't really touch or see. But now we can start getting into things you can touch or see. Which is part of why I love what I do so much, the combination of the unseen with the seen and how they affect each other. It's very, very fascinating. Quantum and deterministic stuff, yeah. Good stuff. <laughs> All right, so parts of a reactor. So we're, we're when I say parts of a reactor, we're going to be talking very, like, fundamental theoretically. We're not really going to be saying, like, uh, this bolt connects this pipe together. We're going to get much more fundamental than that. We're going to talk fuels, moderators, and coolants, because this is pretty much what classifies which type of reactor you have. And everything else, the bolts, the pipes, that all derives from what you have selected as fuels, moderators, and coolants. So this is the this is where you have to start at a theoretical level. Maybe not theoretical, but a fundamental level is the uh, the fundamentals are the fuels, moderators, and coolants of a reactor. Uh, control rods and neutron absorbers, I just want to mention those. Those are of course very important to a reactor, but they don't they don't affect the classification, so uh, we'll talk about them in a second, in the next slide, but they don't affect the classification of a reactor like fuels, moderators, and coolants do. So fuels where the chain reaction happens, of course, need a fissile material. So you, the reason you can use natural uranium is because while it has a small amount of fissile uranium-235, it has doesn't have none, or it doesn't have... It has some, <laughs> let me put it that way. It doesn't have a lot. It's about every atom in 140 is uranium-235, but that's enough for some reactors to start a chain reaction. So you need that fissile material. That'll be important when we get, uh, not to jump too far ahead, but when we talk about something like thorium or plutonium as a fuel. Yeah, so uh, with nuclear fuel, the main thing that's really important is the enrichment of the fuel. That is important. That's uh, That affects what you can select as a moderator, whether or not you want a moderator, and then subsequently which kind of coolants you'll need. Reactors are designed for certain, <clears throat> excuse me, certain enrichment levels. Let's just briefly talk about what is known as reactor neutron spectrum. This sounds fancy, but it really just means reactors are designed to split atoms with either fast or thermal neutrons. So let's explain what that means. Thermal neutrons is also, this is from the, the third slide where I said a heat generating reactor is not the same as a thermal reactor. So either fast or thermal, and thermal you can also think of as slow. Because that's what it really means: slow, fast or slow neutrons. So when fissions are when neut when an atom first splits the neutron from, excuse me, when an atom first splits the neutrons from that fission are going incredibly fast, as you can see right there, fourteen thousand kilometers per second. Uh, they don't they don't go anywhere with that kind of speed. They generally only go maybe like one or two or three centimeters in the material but they're going very fast and they only go one or two or three centimeters because they rapidly collide with a bunch of atoms in general it is harder to split atoms with these fast neutrons no different than if you're playing catch with a ball with someone and they throw they really throw it at you fast it's hard to catch so they throw it at you slow it's easier to catch no different in principle from that so if it's harder to split atoms with fast neutrons, that means you need a higher enrichment of fuel. So we're kind of jumping up around into concepts here, but fuel can have different concentrations of the fissile part. So for fa a fast reactor that would use these fresh fresh neutrons, fresh fast neutrons, need a higher concentration of fuel so to make it more likely that they'll hit more atoms. So Harder to split atoms means it's less likely that they are to hit atoms, so you put more fuel atoms in there and kind of, excuse me, I just popped the mic, you kind of equal out those two things. 
a benefit of fast neutrons is that they can do what's called burn uh, nuclear waste to safer forms. So when we say burn, it's you know it's 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 analogous to like uh you know putting something in like a fireplace, put it in there and you burn it and it releases heat. Uh, you nothing is obviously burnt in a reactor, but we call it burning. But that's when you put it in the reactor and bombard it with with neutrons. That can be, uh, you know, burning fuel, which is generally what it means. But yeah, you can put uh, certain fast reactors can take old nuclear waste and uh, burn the the really long lasting isotopes. So uh, when I mentioned earlier the fission products, why does this webcam keep freezing? Um, the the fission products are not generally the the, the long-term radio ha radioactive hazard from spent fuel. So that's fuel that's been in a reactor. Uh, those fission products decay away relatively quickly. What makes nuclear waste radioactive? <clears throat> excuse me. What makes nuclear waste radioactive for so long? Let's go back to the periodic table here. Is that uh, neutrons hit uranium and make neptunium, plutonium, americium, curium? These stick around for a very long time. So like uranium half-lives are in like the millions of years time frame. Some of these other ones are pretty pretty similar to that too. Hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years time frame. Most fission products are in like the hundreds or thousands of years time frame, so a lot shorter. But uh you can if you put this kind of stuff into a, a fast reactor, splitting it will turn it into shorter fission product, shorter half-life fission products as opposed to leaving it as these very long-lived long-lived uh what we call trans uranics here also known as actinides because actinium is the first of this row actinides or trans uranics sometimes abbreviated to true okay so that's a that's a fast reactor we can have reactors that use the that are optimized for the neutrons fresh from a fission, we can also have a thermal or slow neutron reactor. The reason it's called thermal is uh, is that the neutron is in the a thermal equilibrium with its surroundings, because in the world of particles, uh, the energy of a particle is directly correlated to its temperature. So when it's you know going 40,000 kilometers per second, it's pretty hot. But to get down to like a reactor temperature, it's going a lot slower compared to 14,000 kilometers per second, 2,200 meters per second, still fast. But this is a, these are what we call slow neutrons. And they've been slowed down by a moderator, also known as being moderated. Probably heard me mention that before. Uh, the reason you do this is because it's much easier to split atoms with thermal neutrons. The ball analogy from earlier, it's a lot easier to catch a slow ball. A lot easier to split atoms with thermal or slow neutrons. I'll probably bounce back and forth between thermal and slow in this presentation, but I'll I'll try and stick with slow. Thermal's a technical term, but slow is slow is just as good. So you can use low enrichment fuel when you have thermal neutrons, which is cheaper. So up here, with fast neutrons, you need higher enrichments, higher concentrations that costs more money. Low enrichment fuel is cheaper. You can also use uh, no enriched fuel with some reactor designs. We'll get into that later, but uh, that's like the graphite pile in uh, Oppenheimer that had no enrichment, and that was a thermal reactor, slow reactor. Uh, yeah, this is just a little tidbit in this last line, kind of out of place. The first naval reactors used thermal neutrons, and uh, that helped lead to the widespread adoption of certain power plant designs. But yeah, we're kind of jumping way ahead with that, that line there. So just tuck that in your memory for the moment. So a slow reactor has a moderator. It needs a moderator. You cannot have a slow reactor without a moderator. And as I mentioned before, you can use low enriched or natural uranium fuel, uh, which makes it cheaper. All else equal. And then finally, we got the so just to reiterate a fast reactor does not have a moderator so for a fast reactor all you need is a fuel and a coolant you do not need a moderator moderator is only for slow reactors 
But for most slow reactors, the moderator and the coolant are one and the same, but we'll get to that in a second. Coolant, also very important, removes the heat from the fuel. I say heat from the reactor, but it's really heat from the fuel. Otherwise, the fuel will melt. Uh, there's a lot of different types of coolants out there. And we don't just remove the heat to prevent melting. Uh, the heat is what we want to make electricity. So need coolant to get the electricity to the turbine spin and generator. And then down at the bottom here, uh, just in the world of engineering, there is never a perfect choice. Generally speaking, uh, there's always a bunch of considerations that affect a decision as to why someone did what they did. You can never generally just pick your ideal fuel moderator and coolant as if you were just like writing it on a piece of paper. There's always always considerations to be had. So in the world of engineering, there's generally never perfection. In fact, perfect is generally the enemy of good enough. A better way to phrase good enough is like, did you meet the requirements that were asked of you? Is it necessary to go above and beyond those requirements? Generally not. So all right, let's move along here. Uh, first, let's take a look at this lovely picture. This is a the Idaho Advanced Test Reactor at the Idaho National Lab here in the United States. And this is currently operating. This is a very, this is not a, a power generating reactor. This is a research reactor. You can put a bunch of different materials in these channels and hit it with neutron fluxes and they can all operate together. This is a very, very fancy reactor. Very different than the reactors we're talking about here. But uh, it's currently operating, so we're getting this lovely Cherenkov blue glow. And this is basically when uh, beta particles, which is a, a radioactive form of, or uh, electrons emitted from radioactivity, are moving faster than the phase velocity of light and water. <laughs> so that means that the speed of light and water, I think is about like 75% of what it is in a vacuum. So these... Uh, Electrons from radioactive decay beta particles are going a little faster than that. So what you get here is this blue glow, and it's uh, very analogous to a, uh, a sonic boom in air. Like if an aircraft is going supersonic, very analogous to that. It's a sonic boom for radiation underwater. All right, let's briefly touch on control rods and neutron absorbers. Uh, they're really not that important to this discussion, but I just wanted to address them in case anyone's curious. So in normal operation, the power level in a reactor is not even. So like a reactor has, oh, let me use my mug here. Reactor core is generally like a cylindrical, a right, what we call a right circular cylinder like that. That means this shape basically. Don't worry about the hole or the handle on the side. Uh, the power is the highest right in the very middle, both up and down and left to right. So the very center. Uh, the power decreases on the sides and at the top. So when you use control rods, you're trying to... So if the power distribution maybe looks like this, control rods, you can get it maybe like a little flatter. And that's all just to try and have even, even burning in your reactor so the fuel burns at an even rate for mostly monetary uptime purposes. So you don't have to refuel the reactor as much, shift fuel around as much. So that's generally what that is 99% of the reason for control rods existing is to level out the power in the reactor. Uh, some very common neutron absorber, nor, <clears throat> very common neutron absorbers used in control rods are things such as boron, gadolinium, erbium, cadmium. Let's try and find some of these on our periodic table here. We got boron right here. Gadolinium down here, erbium, cadmium, there it is right there. So I think indium, in fact, may be a bit of a neutron absorber too, silver as well. So yeah, stuff tends to be stuff like more in the middle of the table here, it tends to be some good neutron absorbers. And that just means that they, just by virtue of neutrons and protons and how that all comes together, uh, some isotopes are just very good at absorbing neutrons and they use them in control rods. 
And then, of course, in emergencies, a reactor can be scrammed or shut down quickly by inserting all the control rods into the reactor. So I don't work in reactor design, but I'm fairly certain that the control rods that are used for power leveling and then the emergency control rods are two separate systems, but don't quote me on that. Okay, now let's get into fuels. Probably the probably what most of you've been waiting for. Starting to get more into uh it's important to lay the bedwork bedrock. Lay the bedwork. Lay the foundation for talking about this other stuff. I think it'll make more sense. But yeah, fuels. Uranium. This is the most common fuel in the world, and that's because you can dig it out of the ground. It occurs in nature. It is fissile in nature. It is the only naturally occurring fissile isotope, I believe. And of course, by naturally occurring, I mean exists on Earth. All the other fissile isotopes have occurred in nature at one point, of course, but they have very short half-lives. So Earth was created four and a half billion years ago. So they've something like plutonium, their half-lives are more in the hundreds of thousands of year range. So they have long since decayed away. Whatever neutron star collision made this stuff for our solar system or whatever. But uh, yeah, uranium. This isotope, uranium-235. I mentioned this earlier, but natural uranium has very little. Uranium-235, about one part in 143. So it's, yeah, too low of an enrichment for most reactor designs. So most often we have to enrich uranium. Enriching is expensive and hard to do. Early enrichment used gaseous diffusion, thermal diffusion, and calutron processes. That was in World War II in the Manhattan Project, and then... Shortly after that, moved primarily to gaseous diffusion, uh, which is energy intensive, lots of energy needed. So modern enrichment is done with, not all, but a lot of modern enrichment is done with gaseous centrifuges, which instead of uh, gaseous diffusion, use a lot of energy. But gaseous centrifuges, you just spin the heck out of uranium. It uses a lot less energy, 5%, but making centrifuges is very hard. They spin so fast they can shatter and stuff like that. Very technologically advanced thing to do. And uh, those materials that are used to make centrifuges are controlled materials. They're, uh, they are monitored by international watchdog type corporate type of organizations to see if people are trying to get centrifuges to make stuff for bombs or something. Yeah, so that's one of the issues is that, you know, Gaseous centrifuges, are you just enriching it for power plants or are you enriching it for bombs? Uh, it's pretty hard to... If someone says they're only going to do it for power plants and they may have nefarious intentions, uh, they can easily configure that to keep going for bombs. It does not take much more effort once you have the centrifuges. So that gets tricky. But that's a topic for another day. All right, so continuing with uranium, we got... The grades of uranium, I'll just kind of kind of go over some like uh, the, the grades of uranium. There's different levels of enrichment that are used for different things. So natural uranium can be used in a uh, what is called a can-do reactor, canadium and deuterium uranium reactor. Uh, it uses heavy water, that heavy hydrogen deuterium, as we mentioned earlier. We'll get to that in a second. But heavy water allows it to use natural uranium if it's if it uh. It can use natural uranium. I don't think they generally use natural uranium, but they can use natural uranium. And then uh, plutonium breeder reactors for nuclear bombs all use natural uranium because uh, this part, the U-235, does not turn into plutonium. The other part, uranium-238. I don't think I even call it out here. But yeah, uranium-238 is the part that's not fissile, but that does become plutonium. We'll get into that in a second. Low enriched uranium, this is what the vast majority of power reactors in the world presently use. And it's uh, anything just above natural to five weight percent uranium-235. So five weight percent, just uh, it's five percent uranium-235 by weight. That's all that means. And then most power reactors use more like three to five percent uh a few decades ago, it was more like 3%. It's been bumped up to more like 5% these days, and now they're trying to get even more like 6 or 7 or 8%. This is all just to make it so you can 
burn the fuel for longer, change the fuel less often, save some money. All right, the next band we have here is called, uh, this is kind of a newer development. This is high assay, low enriched uranium, uh, abbreviated to H-A-L-E-U, which is pronounced HALU. And this is five to about 20% uranium-235. This is new advanced reactor designs, like small modular reactors. All those are being designed to use HALU. Uh, this type of stuff could potentially be put in existing reactors, but probably not generally speaking. Reactors are designed for reactor size is directly proportional to the enrichment of uranium you're using. So that's why something like Chernobyl was this enormous reactor where uh, water reactors tend to be a lot more compact. We'll get into that. And then high enriched uranium. So this is the realm of military. Uh, greater than 20%. So submarine reactors are one naval reactors in general are, uh, they use very high enriched uranium cause you can make your reactor very small. The fuel lasts a long time. Typically in submarines, you don't, you want it to not, you want to not refuel your submarine cause you got to cut it open to do that generally, which is expensive and time consuming. So, uh, these submarine reactors can go for 20 years without being refueled. And then also nuclear bombs. Oh, but first we get to that. Yeah, Soviet Russian submarine reactors, about 68%. So getting up there. U.S. Navy submarine reactors, about 90%. Really up there. Nuclear bombs, you want about 85% or greater. All right, so we're done with plutonium. Let's move on. Excuse me. We're done with uranium. Let's move on to plutonium. Plutonium, yeah. So plutonium, as I mentioned with uranium, does not occur in nature on Earth in any significant quantities. There may be some trace amounts from radioactive decay, but uh, nowhere near anything like uranium. So for all intents and purposes, it does not exist on Earth naturally. And again, naturally is, uh, can you dig it out of the ground? Yeah, so sometimes plutonium or stuff like that will be called like man-made. Uh, it gets pedantic, but it's like, no, it, it technically does occur in nature. It's just the, the plutonium that was on Earth has decayed away. It doesn't exist here anymore. So it technically is man-made because there's nowhere else to get it. But it's not like we just decided to make an element. Like <laughs> the laws of physics already determined that plutonium exists, if that makes sense. So the paradoxical part about plutonium is that it does not exist on Earth. However, to get it, you have to make it in a reactor. So there's no way to make plutonium without uranium. Both in that uranium has to be turned into plutonium, and then you need uranium to start your reactor to make plutonium. So plutonium, as I mentioned earlier, is made from uranium-238, which is not fissile, but is instead fertile. It can be bred into plutonium. And yeah, a fertile isotope can absorb a neutron to become a fissile isotope, which is called breeding, which is something that uh, some newer advanced reactor designs are trying to do because uh, a breeder reactor can make the same amount of fuel that it consumes or even more. Uh, the, you'd want to make more if you're trying to make, uh, generally speaking, if you're trying to make nuclear bombs, but you could also make more and put it in other reactors, I guess, but it's generally for making bombs. And then, yeah, so most power reactors today, not most, all, pretty much all, there may be some exceptions, but pretty much in the United States, at least, probably in France and the UK and as well, but all reactors that are used to generate electricity are burning reactors. They consume more fissile material than they make. All power reactors make a small amount of plutonium just because of neutrons flying around. When neutrons fly around, you tend to make new elements, but uh, not really any sizable amount. They use more fuel than they make. They do make plutonium, but they burn more uranium than they make plutonium. People in my comments for the Chernobyl series have often said that the RBMK could be used to breed plutonium. That's something I still want to like look into and address. I, I'm not sure that it could. But 
that's a topic for another day. Yeah, so breeding, another way to make nuclear fuel. Uh, generally more complicated and expensive than enriching uranium. That part I'm not sure about. It's another avenue to make uranium. But uh, yeah, I think I would say it's more it's more complicated than making than enriching uranium. At least uh, nowadays with centrifuges. Back in the Manhattan Project, I'm actually not sure which was more complicated or expensive because some of those enrichment facilities were enormous buildings, and enrichment took like 10% of the United States power electrical grid production to to do. <laughs> so maybe nowadays it's more complicated and expensive than enriching because you have to make a reactor, but it's another way to do it. They're both they're both uh, technologically difficult, but the the, the thing with enriching uranium is that you can just do it. It's just a, uh, a physical process with uh, physical and chemical processes. With breeding fuel, you need a reactor and you need uranium, some amount of uranium. You always need uranium to start a breeder reactor for the very first time. So what I mean by very first time is if a country has no nuclear reactor program and is not getting help from other countries, if they want to make plutonium as a fuel, if they want to breed thorium as a fuel, they need uranium to start that reactor for the first time. You cannot start a reactor with plutonium because it doesn't exist yet and because thorium is not fissile. But we're, we're about to get to thorium, but I just wanted to touch on that. Breeding, you always need uranium to start it up for the very first time. Uh, to make this nuclear fuel... Well, yeah, so you can use breeding to make this nuclear fuel. If you want to remove it to put it into other fuel, you have to do what's known as reprocessing. You won't use the those old fuel assemblies that were already in the reactor because they're, they're one, very radioactive, and two, uh, being in a reactor is a harsh environment, so they're not as structurally sound. So you take that fuel out and you reprocess it, which is a chemical process. You extract the unused uranium and plutonium from it, and you put that into new fuel. Uh, yeah, this is reprocessing. This is also what was done to purify plutonium for nuclear bombs. And uh, it's something that other countries do. The UK does reprocessing. France does. Japan does. The United States does not. It was briefly illegal in the late 70s, but then when uh, Jimmy Carter was president, but then Ronald Reagan became president and made it legal again but the reason the primary reason that the u.s does not have reprocessing is that it's more expensive than just enriching uranium and the u.s has access to a lot of uranium there's a lot of uranium in the united states there's a lot of uranium in canada which is i think the uh the u.s gets most of its uranium from canada not overall perhaps but in terms of exports or imports most of it comes from canada so it's just cheaper to to do uranium than to reprocess. Reprocess is an advanced nuclear fuel cycle thing. I don't think we really touch on it too much more than that in this lecture, but this is uh, that's a topic for another lecture. And then, yeah, to reiterate, plutonium is used almost exclusively for nuclear bombs. But reactors can use pure plutonium as a fuel. There's nothing saying they can't. In fact, well, let me not get ahead of myself here. <laughs> Uh, plutonium can be mixed with uranium called mixed oxide fuel or MOX. This was something that was proposed to be done more in like the uh, 2000s. I think MOX has pretty much gone away. A lot of that was going to be done, I think, at Savannah River to mix some old nuclear bomb plutonium with fuel, but I think the U.S. has decided not to do that. For reasons that I can't remember at the, anymore, but I just know it's it's happening because there's been this huge issue of like, <laughs> I think Savannah River has a bunch of plutonium at it right now, and South Carolina is like, the heck, we didn't want all this plutonium here, so there was like, court settlements and stuff. But anyway, uh, plutonium would actually be, from a pure fuel cycle, power generation standpoint, the best reactor fuel because it has the smallest critical mass of the. The main fissile isotopes so you get the same power for less fuel but uh it's not politically feasible because plutonium equals nuclear bombs in a lot of people's eyes so yeah maybe that'll change but 
for now. It is uh, not politically feasible. I missed a picture on the previous slide. Let's take a look at that. Uh, so we got a, a, this is a billet of highly enriched uranium from the Y-12 National Security Complex. So recovered scrap. Highly enriched, of course, means it's mostly uranium-235, and then it's uh, very most likely related to nuclear bomb production stuff. And then here on the plutonium slide, we got a plutonium-238 pellet. I asked this in a poll on, on the channel yesterday on the YouTube community section, but uh, plutonium-238 is not fissile, but it is used in uh, deep space probes because it gives off a lot of heat for a good chunk of time. And when you get really far in the solar system, or if you're on like Mars or something, uh, something where a solar panel is not going to do it for you, uh, you can use a radioisotope thermal generator. So the immense amount of heat that this gives off, because it has a relatively short half-life, and you can turn that into electricity. It's very inefficient, but you can do it. And uh, it's always on. It's always there. I think some remote military installations in the Cold War, maybe today still, used these for power as well. All right, that's it for plutonium. Let's move on now to thorium. Uh, this is another possible nuclear fuel. So it's more abundant than uranium in the ground, but what's interesting is that uranium is actually more abundant than thorium in the ocean. And this is this is a real thing. This is not a joke. <laughs> uh, seawater extraction of uranium is a real thing that could that could happen someday. But uh, compared to other things like carbon or nitrogen or whatever, um, both of these are still very rare, relatively speaking. Okay, so what are what's what's the deal with thorium? Thorium is not fissile. Thorium is not the actual fuel. It is fertile, so it's like uranium two thirty eight. You have to breed thorium two thirty two. I don't think I even write thorium two thirty two on here, but the isotope is thorium two thirty two. You hit that with a neutron, and it can become thorium or excuse me, uranium two thirty three, which is also a fissile isotope. <clears throat> So like I stated with plutonium, that the uh, for thorium, the fuel cannot only be thorium. If you're starting a reactor for the first time, a thorium reactor, you need uranium or plutonium or something fissile in there to start the reactor. So that is one issue with thorium, is that it is not, it's not a single fuel cycle like uranium. Like a uranium reactor, you only ever need uranium. But with thorium, you need something else to start it. Uranium or plutonium. Uranium would be an obvious choice because it exists in the ground. Another issue with fertile, fertile is that it means it's a, I'm not going to say it's a neutron absorber like boron or cadmium, but it, it captures neutrons. So to make thorium into uranium-233, it will suck up neutrons from your reactor, which affects the neutron economy. This is a bit of a technical term, but yeah, it just means you're going to have a, you're going to need a lot more neutrons flying around to breed thorium into uranium-233. So when people th say thorium fuel, they really mean uranium-233. It's not thorium itself, again, just to reiterate, is not an actual fuel. It has to become uranium-233. But you can't get uranium-233 without thorium. It doesn't exist on Earth because it has a short half-life, hundreds of thousands of years in the realm of like plutonium half-life. So it's all decayed away. There will be trace amounts, but again, trace. Uh, U-233 breeding makes a lot of radioactivity, so this makes process reprocessing more difficult and expensive, but of course, not impossible with engineering. No perfect solutions, but uh, just things to deal with there. Alright, Thorium Part 2. Talk about some of this thorium hubbub. So it is not this silver bullet magical fuel that a lot of people say it is. Perhaps unfortunately. But uh a the, nu the nuclear industry does not need a thorium. That is not not really the issue here. Um all con yeah, so all countries' nuclear fuel cycles right now are uranium based. To switch all that to thorium based would be very very costly, time-consuming uh, 
for no apparent benefit. So what, what do I mean by no apparent benefit? So there's plenty of uranium, plenty of uranium on the planet, both in the ground and in the seawater, if we need it to last a long time. And uh, you can you can also breed uranium into plutonium. You don't need thorium to breed into uranium-233. You can breed uranium into plutonium. I know I said earlier that it was politically infeasible, but uh, I feel like it's as likely to get plutonium breeding from a politically infeasibility point as it is to uh, switch the entire uranium fuel cycle to a thorium fuel cycle. But this isn't just a knock against thorium. This is this is like switching any of this thing this far in. So it was kind of proposed back in the U.S. in the fifties in the United States that you could do like a thorium cycle. And if the U.S. had done a thorium cycle back then, it would be just as unappealing to switch to uranium today. Just everything is geared for uranium right now. Switching that to thorium would not be an easy undertaking uh, another thing that proponents of thorium tend to say i don't know if i should say proponents seriously but maybe i'll say a myth of thorium out there is that uh, you can't make nuclear weapons with it oh you can uranium 233 can most certainly still be a nuclear bomb uh i iaea safeguards and International Atomic Energy Agency and other like non-proliferation agreements and inspections are what prevent nuclear proliferation. That is, nuclear bombs from getting into uh, the hands of other countries. It's not that uh, you know thorium would be this magic fuel that can't make bombs that would solve all that. Uh, you know, proliferation generally really hasn't happened on a large scale with the the uranium and plutonium out there. It's uh, the safeguards and such that prevent the proliferation. So switching to thorium for that reason would not not make a lot of sense. You can still make bombs with uranium-233. Now, I'm not going to be all bashing. A country like India, which is early in its thorium cycle. Excuse me. It was a bit of a, a, a faux pas there. Faux pas? What's the one where you say what you're thinking before you say a Freudian slip? Is that it? I don't know. Anyway. Uh, a country like India that has a, a young and early nuclear fuel cycle, it could make sense for them to switch to thorium. Because I believe India has a lot more thorium than uranium. Uh, so that's a place where it could it could make sense. But uh, the, the real big issue with like a thorium cycle, in my opinion, is that you need, you need uranium or something to get it started. So you're going to have to do some uranium stuff in addition to thorium. You can't just do thorium. But... Uh, I'm not sure how, how big of an issue that is necessarily. But just as a, an interesting little uh, tidbit, thorium has a very very long half-life, 14 billion years. I don't think it has the longest half-life of any isotope, but it's up there. It's pretty darn long. So it's yeah longer than the, the known age of the universe. <laughs> All right, so that's it for like the major fuels. It really is just like uranium, plutonium, maybe thorium. Um, there's a whole host of like other fissile isotopes that are much more rare. Well, first, before we get to that, um, plutonium isotope 241 is also a fissile isotope, but its half-life is only 14 years. That is way too short to be viable. Uh, you know, just after sitting in a reactor for one month, a sizable chunk of that will have already decayed away, and you count on that being there for the reactor. So, yeah, that's not really a uh, too much of a feasible one. Uh, you, you make it in the same way as plutonium-239, but it just has to be in that breeding reactor for longer. So the re it really makes no sense to go for plutonium-241. Short half-life takes longer to do. No no real upside there. And uh, yeah, I think I just mentioned this, but there's a lot of other exotic fissile isotopes, but they're, uh, they're very rare. Hard to make. Radiation concerns, half-life concerns. We have uranium, so why why do those crazy ones? A lot of those exotic ones are more in the realm of like nuclear bombs, nuclear bomb research, because some of them have some rather small critical masses. 
Uh, I mentioned this earlier, but yeah, the transuranic wa wastes. So that's like your plutoniums, your neptuniums, your curiums. Uh, you can use this as as a type of fuel in fast reactors. So again, you put it in there to to split it because that will make it less radioactive. But uh, they can't support chain reactions, and that's true. But when you split them, they they will still give off some neutrons. So the thought there is that you could if an if a neutron is going to be absorbed anyway, you might as well have it hit like a transuranic waste atom that's going to give off at least some neutrons back and keep your neutron numbers up in your reactor.